you should go to my website because in my website what you will find is a resource page that you guys can use readily uh, let me blow this up okay so um remember to get to my website you can just google f garces but hopefully you guys have a bookmark my website just like me this is basically the home page right here or the splash page and of course you can access your course here the lab course here and these are the other courses that i teach this spring but go over here to fog links okay if you go to fog links that'd be a really important uh, link for you guys to use if you click on that you'll see two pieces of um well there's actually a lot of information here like periodic table, polyatomic ions that you guys will need to um, know for the next quiz, nomenclature. But two important um, links are information equation. If you click on that, what you will find is this right here. These are generally the classes that I teach, Chem 100, 152, 200, and 201, at least the heavy duty ones. Go to um, Chem 100, especially the midterm or the final, and what you will find there is a whole bunch of conversion factors. These things right here, like that's the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory chart you guys will use in the next chapter. These are ions. These are stoichiometry map. These are periodic table. So this is a really good handy um, equation page to use when you're taking my quizzes or exam. Okay, since it's open notes, open books, you can certainly use this, especially the conversion factors right here. Okay, the other link I want to show you is um, go back to fog links again. Again, that's right here. And you will see the supplemental notes and hints. That's a really handy um, um, resource to have. This was created back in May, but I made revisions. Um, every semester, but what you will find is um, this right here is a short, for those of you who were here last week or seen the video, it kind of shows you how to determine the number of significant figures depending on what value you have, okay? And I think last week I showed you guys the Pacific Atlantic rule. And this right here gives you an example using that Pacific Atlantic, Atlantic rule. Uh, this right here is the heating cooling curve that you guys will cover in chapter three. Okay, so this is a good resource to have. And it tells you how much energy you need to expend in order to change one gram of water, either from solid ice to um, liquid water, or maybe liquid water at zero degrees to liquid water at 100 degrees. This is a chart that you guys have seen in chapter three. So I want to point you to, to these two resources, especially for this first quiz. Then uh, the next quiz, which we will cover in chapter, which is chapter four, you guys will, will see this, which looks intimidating, yes. But hopefully this will make sense once we cover the, that particular section. So uh, those are two resources that you guys want to download. Okay, just Google F Garces. And when you do that, F G A R C E S. And when you do that, you should come to the first place, um, the first link. I've been around long enough that it comes out in Google. So just Google F Garces and you'll get there. Okay. That way you don't have to memorize the URL address. Um, so, um, let me see. With the Canvas test will be similar to questions we have done on mastering for chapters. It'll be similar, but also let me just show you one more thing. On this left menu, what you will see is sample exam, because when you click on that, these are the style of questions I've asked in the past, and I've broken it down based on the um, modular quizzes that we have in this course. Uh, remember, we cover three chapters in this course for the first module quiz. And the first chapter is basically about scientific method and maybe chemicals and chemistry, some miscellaneous information. 
Uh, don't worry about your study habits. There are probably not going to be any questions on that. And then the second question, the second topic was measurement units, uh, dimensional analysis, uh, density, specific gravity. That's all part of chapter two. And then chapter three, matter, energy, and some sort of nutrition calculation. So um, measurements and units encompass everything from dimensional analysis to exponential notation to rounding off. So when you click on that, again, let me just show you where that is. When you go to my webpage, go to your course, go to the left menu, you'll see sample exams. And then right here are the questions relating to um, relating to your your course. And if you go to measurements and units, these are typical questions that you might see. Okay, especially since a lot of you are in allied health. Um, a nurse administers appropriate dosage for atropine sulfate, 165 mL. So this is a dimensional analysis problem. Okay, and the question here is how many tablets are needed to give the correct dose? To the patient. So you work out this problem and you want to see the answer. Well, go to the very top. Within each section, there's a link here that says key. Try and do this first and then look at the key. But if you click on the key, it'll give you the answers in red. Okay. So um, let's go back and you can get back to the main um, sample test or you can look at the um, key right here. Okay, so, so that's more in the flavor of what you will see in terms of my test, but certainly the my lab and mastering, there'll, there'll be questions that are similar to that as well. It's sort of a mix. Okay, uh, some of my favorite questions, especially um, later on, is tell me whether, see, these are all significant figures uh, in terms of that. Uh, tell me whether or not something is a physical change or a chemical change. Tell me whether or not it's a, a compound or a mixture, things like that. And that's what you see in this sample test right here. Energy, heating, and cooling curve, you see that here as well. Okay. So um, that's a good resource to have. The main thing that I would like you guys to know in... Um, in chapter three is know about matter and its classification. The classification of matter is, um, that, that's on lecture notes. Let me just see real quick. It's in lecture notes uh, right here. Oops, I will be right here. Matter, class of matter, because a lot of students in the past would mix the classification of matter with the phase of matter, and they're not the same. The phase of matter is what physical form it has depending on the conditions. Like we have a solid phase, a liquid phase, and also a gas phase. Those are the phases of matter. We actually have a fourth four phase that's actually more common, but not here on planet Earth. That's the plasma phase. The plasma phase is when you take matter and you remove all the electrons from that, and it's basically a plasma, okay? So those are the four phases, but the three main phases, the liquid, solid, and gas. And we'll see that more in chapter three in, in the later section. Like what happens at the molecular level when you have ice? When you have ice, water arranges itself, so it maximizes these forces that holds them in. And you notice there's a lot of void space in between. Why do you think when you freeze water, it expands? Because they take on a configuration that puts a lot of space in between the water molecules. Okay, so, so that's what you see right here. It, it, water, when the, it's a solid, it takes on this hexagonal configuration, and there's a lot of void space in between, and it takes on more volume. But as you heat it up, and here you see what happens to ice as we heat it up, it starts to move faster and starts to vibrate. And then they start tumbling am amongst each other. And that takes up less space, actually. Okay, it actually takes up less space. And so here, again, is, is just a um, picture of thousands of water molecules in its solid form, and now we're heating it up. As we heat it up, they start to break apart from each other, 
And look, notice how these things are moving faster and tumbling amongst each other. Now we're, we're, we're undergoing the melting process because in the center, it's still solid, but in the edges, it's turning into a liquid, okay? And then as we apply more heat, everything starts to melt, okay? Eventually, what you have is the water molecules tumbling amongst each other. And then the higher temperature will just make these water molecules move faster. And then it gets to the point where the water molecules will now separate from each other because what we have is the gas phase. So, so that's what ha happens at the atomic level when you're melting ice. Okay, so let me just uh, move on. This is what I wanted to uh, go over before. Um, Anything else? These, this is the classification of matter. What we have is the other wing of this is if we have the universe, but if we just concentrate on matter, we either have a pure substance or a mixture. Mixture is two or more substances that are combined. Pure substance is like H2O, water. It's one entity or O2, oxygen that we breathe or um, NaCl, sodium chloride. It has its own unique identity, and it's it basically has its own chemical formula. A mixture, however, has two or more pure substances that are put together, like salt water. Salt water has sodium chloride in H2O. Or maybe we have vinegar and water. Vinegar would be acetic acid and water and maybe something else, but it's a mixture. It has different components. If you have a pure substance, it can be broken down to its elements or its compound. Compounds would be like NaCl or sugar, uh, C12, H22, O11, okay, or methane, CH4, or carbon dioxide, CO2. Notice that these chemicals have their own formula and it, it's a unique um, entity. Elemental would be like the periodic table, oxygen or mercury or sodium or um, nitrogen, it's only got one type of element in the structure. Mixtures are going to be like NaCl plus water, okay? Or maybe you, you have sand, silicon dioxide, plus, actually this is a hedro, sand and water. When the mixture is not uniform throughout, like vinegar and water, then it's called a heterogeneous mixture. But if it's uniform throughout and you can't tell whether you've got um, different individual things in there, but it looks like it's one item, then it's a homogeneous mixture. So these are the classifications of matter not to be mixed up with the phase of matter, okay? That there's a big difference. And here are more examples of that. You've got sodium chloride, baking soda, H2O. These are the elemental substance. Iodine, which you guys will see in lab. This is diamond. Diamond's actually pure carbon. Graphite, if you have a pencil and the tip of your pencil, okay, is actually lead, um, graphite. Okay, even though we call it lead, it's not lead. Okay, it's not lead. It's just called lead because that's the terminology we use, but it's graphite, okay? Um, that's what you see right here, that's graphite. And then um, other chem chemicals like mercury, um, things like that. So these are examples of compounds, elements, and then of course we have mixture. This is gold jewelry. If we have 24 karat gold, then that's pure gold. But if you say you're getting married or you're getting engaged and your fiance only gives you a 12 carat um, uh, engagement ring, then they're pretty cheap. It's only 50% pure gold, okay? So the carat tells you the purity. 24 is, is pure gold, 12 is 50-50. And what they do is they, in order, gold is actually very soft and permeable in that it, it bends. And so in order to harden it, they mix it in with like silver or say nickel or some other. You might even mix it in with platinum, which is more expensive than gold, but um, they mix it so, so that it becomes a little bit more hard and doesn't bend, 
Okay. Uh, some people are allergic to jewelry, and that's because they might be allergic to the nickel that is in that jewelry or something else. But uh, 24 karat is pure gold. Carrot is K R T, not to be confused with carrot with a C. Carrot with a C measures the weight of diamonds. Carrot with a K tells you the purity of gold. Okay. Uh, wine is an example of a mixture. It's got ethanol in there, it's got water in there, and it's got other chemicals that um, makes, makes it flavor, but it, it looks like it's homogeneous because you can't see the suspended particles in there. Foam or whipped cream is also a mixture. It's got air and that substance. So these are all examples of mixtures and things like that. Heterogeneous mixture, you got sand, granite, or you got a some sort of, um, this actually is emerald embedded in some sort of rock. And then you got salad or dressing, things like that. Those are all examples of that. And here again is, is the reason why you need to know this is because in chapter five or six, chapter six, we will look at this more closely and then we will be able to name compounds based on its classification. So these are just things that I want you to know in terms of um, matter and its classification versus its phase. Okay. Um, the other thing here, you see this heating cooling curve, it shows you the, the different diagrams of what water looks like at the atomic level. And then these are the energy that you need in order to take, this is all for one gram of H2O, okay? Now, if the question says, suppose you have 25 grams, calculate it for one gram, and then multiply by 25 at the end, okay? That's the simplest way to do these types of problem. Because let me try and explain this. If you have one gram of water and you have say um, ice at say minus 30, and you wanna raise it to ice at zero degrees, then that's a 30 degrees change. Well, for e every degree of ice, it'll cost you 0.5 calories, okay, per gram. So if we do one gram and we're changing it 30, all you have to do is multiply 30 by 0.5, that's 15, okay? And if we have say 10 grams, just take 15, multiply by 10. So calculate everything based on one gram and at the end, just multiply by the weight. So suppose we have uh, 10 grams of um, water and we're, raised, we're taking it from 30 degrees to right here, 100 degrees steam. And the question is how much energy is it going to cost you to do that? So the strategy here is to use this chart and calculate for one gram how much energy it'll cost to go um, to go each leg in this particular diagram. So let me uh, clean this up real quick and then um, do this and show you how easy these types of pro problems are if you know the trick. And this is the trick that I'm showing you. Okay, so what we're doing is we're taking a block of water and we're going to calculate it for one gram. And we're taking it from minus 30 to zero. How many calories will that cost? Well, it costs 0.5 calories per degree. So if we're taking it from 30 to zero, then we're taking it 30 degrees but it's gonna cost 0.5 calories per degree. So that's gonna be 15 calories. So that's 15 calories, okay, for that one gram. We're calculating everything based on one gram. Now we're taking that piece of ice at zero degrees and we're converting it to liquid water at zero degrees. How many calories is that gonna cost? One gram again, it's gonna cost 80 calories. I like to calculate things in calories because it's so much easier to, to use these numbers. If I need to convert calories to joules, then I know 
I can use the conversion factor of 4.184 joules equals one calorie. I can just do that at the end when I have my answer. So um, it, we have one gram. How much is it going to cost me to go from zero to, to zero solid to liquid? It's going to cost me 80 calories. Again, for one gram. Now I'm going from zero liquid. It's zero liquid right here. Zero solid would be over here. I'm at zero liquid. And I'm going to go to 100 liquid. I'm going to go right from here to here. How many calories will that cost me? It's one calorie per, gra per gram. So that's going to cost me 100 calories. OK? It's going to cost me 100 calories for one gram to go 100 degrees. Now I want to take my water from uh, 100 degrees liquid, that's 100 degrees liquid, to 100 degrees steam, 100 degrees gas. And that's my final destination right here. I'm going to stop right there. OK. How much is, is that going to cost? It's going to cost me 540 calories. That, that's the specific heat to convert. Why is it so much? Because you actually need to separate matter completely from each other. That's why it costs so much compared to, to this right here. It's only 80 to melt it, but costs 540 to vaporize it. So that's 540. So let's add that all up. We have 15. Oops. Let me add up 15 plus 80 plus 100 plus 540. This is for one calorie. I mean, for one gram. So when we add this all up, this is the number I get. 8 plus 4 is 12, 13. Um, 735 to go from here, minus 30, to here, gas at 100 degrees. So if it costs me 735 calories for one gram, then it's going to cost me 735, oops, 735 times 10. because now I have 10 grams, 7,350 calories to take 10 grams of uh, solid ice at minus 30 and raise, change it completely to steam at 100 degrees. See how easy that is compared to like doing all these formulas? You just use this chart to calculate each leg because each leg has different specific heat and then just add it together. OK, and so that's how you would also work that exercise that I gave you in order to, to do these types of calculation. It's so much easier if you work everything through with one gram and at the end just multiply it by the mass. And if I need to convert this to joules, let me clean my slate here. The answer is, uh, let me just write this, 730 calories. If I need to convert this to joules, then this is what I will do. How many joules does it take to do that? If I have 10 grams, then I would take seven, take my pen, seven, 7,350 calories. And I know that for every one calorie, I have 4.184 joules. Then I would just do that. I would use dimensional analysis. And if I do that math, okay, I would take in my calculator 7350 and multiply it by 4.184. And that would be, um, in this particular case, 30,752 joules for, for that particular answer. I, I do the hard calculation in the back end. I, I mean, I do the, the conversion in the back end, converting calories to joules or um, con normalizing based on the mass of the item that I have. So that's how you would use this chart in order to do the, those types of problems. And generally, in this class, we do it for water. Um, we might do it for some other material, but it would be the same. You just have to look at the energies that are associated, because this is unique for water. Th these numbers are unique for water. If it's something else, then you would have different numbers.
Okay, so um, if you look at if you look at this right here, what you will see is that's the cooling process. Okay, and this right here sort of tells you again whether you have calories or joules or whatever. These are the different values that you might have. I like to use this first one because it's so much easier in terms of doing the math. But if you need to calculate in terms of joules per gram or calories per mole, you can certainly do that. Don't worry about the moles too much. You probably won't get that question. It's because we haven't covered the moles yet until we hit chapter seven, okay? So these are just um, some sample questions in the back end of these slides that shows you basically the same thing and, and how to do these calculations, okay? Um, in a sauna, 150 grams is converted from steam. Um, 150 grams of water is converted to convert it at 100 degrees. How many calories of heat are needed? So. In Asana, we have 150 grams of water, and we're it's converted to steam at 100 degrees. How many kilojoules, kilocalories are used? What we need is uh, the initial condition. Let me just think is the initial condition. Um, let me see. The what I would do is I would say that the um, initial condition is the 150 grams of H2O at 100 degrees liquid to 100 degrees steam. Remember that it costs 540 calories for one gram. So what we need to do is um, to go from liquid to steam. So all we need to do is multiply this by 150 grams and that'll be the total calories and this would be 540 times 100 that'll be 5454000 calories or 554 kilocalories remember that a kilo means a thousand so one kilocalorie equals a thousand calories. So that would be the answer for this. It's pretty straightforward in terms of that. Okay. And so that, that basically is what we have right here. And you will see that um, in this particular case, they got, let me uh, clean my, my, my uh, writing here. Okay, so we have one gram and we're taking it uh, from the liquid to the gas and they're calculating. You see, 540 times um, 150. Oh, sorry, 540 times 150. I did my math wrong. That is 81 thousand calories. Okay, did my math wrong. So um, that would be 81 kilocalories. This is the math. Oops. This is the mass. And this number right here comes from the fact that it takes, let me just show you this real quick. Let's go back to our heating cooling curve because you need to know where that number comes from. that right there. We're going from here to here. We're going from 100 degrees liquid to 100 degrees steam. It's going to cost you 540 calories per gram. Okay, so that's, that, that's why that answer came out to be 540 times 150, because that's the mass of water that we have. So, so, um, Take a look at the back end of these lecture notes because they give you examples of how to use the heating cooling curve or heating cooling curve calculations, okay?
heating cooling curve calculation. Let's try this one and then I will um, open it up for like questions that you would like me to go over specifically. Um, picture contains 0.75 liters. 0.75 liters is 750 grams. We're gonna use that at the end uh, of water at four degrees. So we're starting at four degrees, okay? And is removed from the refrigerator. So it's removed from the refrigerator, so it's warming up, okay? How many kilocalories and kilojoules are needed? Remember that one calorie equals 4.184 joules. One kilocalorie equals 4.184 kilojoules. We're just multiplying both by a thousand, okay? Um, are needed to warm the water to a room temperature of 22 degrees. Ha, huh, this problem is super easy. All you gotta do is take 22, subtract it from four, that's a temperature difference. So when you do that, I believe that's somewhere in the order of 18, 22, eight, uh, four, uh, that's gonna be 18 degrees. So for one gram, it's gonna cost 18 calories to go from four degrees to 22 degrees. But since we have 750 cal grams, then we just need to take 18 calories and we need to multiply it by 750 because that's the mass that we have. So we'll do that in our calculator. And that comes out to 1,000, 13,500 calories, small calories. This is equal to 13.5 kilocalories because we're just moving it to the thousandth place. And now I want to convert it to joules. And I have um, uh, one kilocalorie right here. I'm using that. 4.184 kilojoules. And so when I do that, I'm just taking 13.5 and multiplying it by 4.184. I have a total of 56, 13.5 times 4.184. That comes out to 56.484. Kilojoules. Now, let me tell you a little bit about significant figures, okay? Because that, that's an important part of this particular section. Go back over here and look at the mass of water because that's what we, we are using. That's our original data. And that mass of water only has two significant figures. 0.75 liters has two significant figures. 750 grams without the decimals, two significant figures. So you're going to round off your answer because we're, what we're doing here is multiplying to two significant figures. This answer is 56 kilojoules. This answer would be um, 14, let me just, 14 kilocalories. Okay, we, we round up if we're rounding up to an even number. So 13.5, five is right in the midway. I'm rounding up because, uh, if I stay, I stay as an odd at the halfway point, but I want to round up always to an even number. So the answer will be 14 kilocalories and 56 kilojoules. And if you do this, what you will see is that um, that's basically what I have right here. 13.5 um, calories or 13.5 kilocalories. And uh, in this particular case, it'll be um, 58.2 kilojoules. Let me just see if I got that right. 13.5 times 4.184. Yeah, this, this should be 56.5 kilojoules. Okay, I did my math wrong, but that's the calculation. It, it was pretty straightforward in terms of that, because we're just taking it. Let me clear my, my slate here. Here's what we you guys are doing in this pro problem. You're taking it 
from here to here, minus four, I, I mean, positive four to 22. That's, that right there is 18 degrees. It's gonna cost 18 calories. Okay, that's, that's how you do that. So um, that's a big part of um, chapter three. Another part of chapter three that you guys should know is this right here. And you guys know that the food group are proteins, carbs, and fats. And the caloric value is four calories, calories per gram. Carbs are four calories per gram. And fat is what? Nine calories per gram. Now, I need to explain to you another thing that's really important. We have a calorie, which we abbreviate C-A-L, and a calorie, which we abbreviate C-A-L. One is a small C, the other is a big C, okay? And the reason why that's important is because one, these are called food calories. That's these right here. Is it equal to a thousand small calories? A calorie is defined. These calories are defined as the amount of energy you need to use to raise one gram of water one degree. That's how calories define. But if you take a thousand of that, then you have a kilocalorie and a kilocalorie is equal to one food calorie. Whenever we're talking about diets and nutrition, we're always talking about food calories, okay? Food calories with a capital C. So make sure you understand that because small C and capital C are, are different by a thousand, by a thousand. So, um, in science, when we're doing heat exchange and all that, we use small c. But when we're talking about caloric value in nutrition, we're talking about kilocalories, big C, okay? And this is important right here because you'll see a bunch of questions in which I tell you, okay, I have a candy bar. Okay, I have a candy bar. And that candy bar has um, let's say it weighs about 15 grams and it's got um, let's say that 50% of it is fat free. Okay, 50% of it is fat free. Um, what is the caloric value? How many calories does that candy bar have? Well, the neat thing about fat-free is that if it's fat-free, that means that that's a funny, that's a funny um, label whenever they say fat-free. The reason why it's funny is because if it's 50% fat-free, that means 50% of it is fat, okay? 50% fat-free means only half of it is not fat and the other half is fat. So half of 15 is 7.5. 7.5 will be proteins plus carbs. And 7.5 of that will be fat. All we got to do now is do the math. Let me clean this up. Okay. And figure out how many calories this candy bar has. And remember, when we calculate calories, it's food calories. So 7.5 grams and it doesn't matter whether we separate it to proteins and carbs because they're both the same caloric wise. So we're just gonna say it's four calories, food calories per gram. We're not saying that um, three grams of it is protein and 4.5 grams of it is is carbohydrate, it doesn't matter because they're both four calories per gram. So you don't have to 
distinguish that. And then we're going to add it to 7.5 grams times nine calories per gram. And then we're going to add that up. So this part right here, where we take 7.5 and we multiply it by four, comes out to 30 food calories. Okay, and we take 7.5 and multiply it by nine and we get 67.5 food calories. And then we just add it up. And what we get is a total of 97, 97.5 food calories for that, for that candy bar. Okay, so things like that. When, when you do problems like that, remember the caloric values of your, your food because you'll be, and then I ask you, okay, I eat two candy bars. I, I eat two candy bars. And remember that each candy bar is equal to 97.5 food calories. And the question is, how far or how long do I have to exercise? How long do I have to uh, run in order to burn off that food? And so what you will need in order to solve that problem is you need to figure out how much energy uh, do you need to expend for the exercise. And so in chapter three, what you will also see is this chart right here, okay? It's, it's basically the um, exercise chart. And the exercise chart tells you how much, um, let's see. Let me see if I have it in your book somewhere, but um, actually, let me find that in the lecture notes real quick. It's uh, lecture notes 3.1. Let me show you that real quick so that you guys can, can. So suppose I want to run and running is about 750 kilocalories. Remember one kilocalorie equals one food calorie per hour. And the question is, how long do I need to run in order to expend that, that, those two candy bars? So I have two candy bars. Let me just show you how this is done using dimensional analysis. Two candy bars. And I know that one candy bar is 97.5 calories. And I know that it takes 750 kilocalories per hour. See how dimensional analysis allows you to do this without an equation? All I got to do now is do the math to 97.5 and divide by 750. And I get 0 0.26 hours. So I would need to run less than 30 minutes to burn off those two candy bars if I am expending 750 uh, calories per hour in my exercise. Suppose I'm not running. Suppose in this particular case, oh, oops, I forgot to, I forgot to do this. Let me go back to my iPad. Okay, <laughs> because you guys didn't see me do this calculation. Let me um, go back and redo that for you so that you can see how dimensional analysis is really your friend. Okay, so let's say I'm not, I'm not running. Let's say, let me just take a look at that exercise chart. Let's say that I am, according to this exercise chart, let's say I'm sleeping. Okay, sleeping takes about 60, 60 food calories per hour. How long do I need to sleep to burn off those, those two candy bars? Again, let me show you how that's done using dimensional analysis. 
You want to use dimensional analysis because dimensional analysis is your friend. So um, the question was, I have 15 grams. I have 15 grams uh, equals one candy bar. Okay. And I have 50% um, fat free by mass, what is the caloric value? Well, if it's 50% by mass fat-free, that means that um, 15 divided by two is 7.5 grams. So 7.5 grams, is proteins plus carbohydrate and 7.5 grams is fat, okay? So I know that proteins and carbohydrates are four calories per gram. I know that fat is nine calories per gram. So I can use that information to figure out if I've got 7.5 grams of protein and carbohydrate, that gives me a total of 7.5 grams times four calories per gram. Take 7.5, multiply it by four, and I get 30 calories from proteins and carbohydrates, okay? I take the other half and multiply it by nine calories per gram. And that comes from fat. So I take 7.5 and I multiply that by nine and I get 67.5 calories from fat. So when I add these two up, I get a total of 97.5 calories per candy bar. Okay, so that's that's to answer that question. The question was, if a candy bar is 50% fat-free, it's 15 grams, what is the caloric value? That's the word, it, it'll, it'll be 97.5 um, food calories or 97.5 kilocalories. Okay, now the, the, the one of the question was, okay, it takes me about 750 calories per hour if I run. Or if I sleep, it's only gonna cost me 60 calories. That's the energy I expend per hour. So I'm gonna do the running first. Um, how many, how long should I run if I eat two calories in order for me to burn off that the caloric values from, from two candy bars. So um, the question is how long should I run to burn off two candy bars? So we're going to use dimensional analysis. I've got two candy bars. And I know that for every one candy bar, I got 97.5 calories. Where did I get that? I got that from this right here. 97.5 calories per candy bar equals one candy bar. That's a conversion factor. And then I'm going to use this conversion factor, 750 calories per hour. See how I have calories here? I got to have calories on the bottom in order for it to cancel out. The 750 goes through the calories. The one hour goes on top. Now the calories will cancel. If I do dimensional analysis, make sure you watch that snippet that I put in Canvas on dimensional analysis. Because if you're going to go into nursing, dimensional analysis is also called nursing math. Okay, so it's really useful to know. And if there's one thing that you really need to know in any science course, especially this one, 
So learn how to use dimensional analysis really well. So when I do the math, I'll take two, multiply by 97.5 and divide by 750. And when I do that, I come up with 0 0.26 hours. If I want to convert that to minutes, then I would use the conversion factor one hour equals 60 minutes. All I need to do is multiply that by 60. And I would have to run 15.6 um, minutes in order to burn those two candy bars, expending 750 calories per, per hour. Now, if I want to sleep, then all I've got to do is change this conversion factor right here. So I'm going to use this. I'm going to change this conversion factor right here to 60 calories per hour. Excuse me, we are not able to see the, your um, writing. Thanks. Can you see that now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Sometimes I'm doing these things and I only see what I'm writing. And uh, sometimes I forget to look at my other screen so that um, um, I, I get to see what you see. So, so yeah. So what I'm doing now is I'm just changing this conversion factor and putting 60 calories per hour so that um, I calculate the number of hours I need to sleep in order to burn those two candy bars. And so when I do the math, you notice, Again, why dimensional analysis is so useful. All I'm doing is changing one thing in this formula. And now I um, come up with 3.25 hours. If I want to burn those two candy bars and all I want to do is sleep. So, so that's the type of um, problem that you would see relating um, units of energy to caloric values, okay? So hopefully th this will be um, in the Zoom video and you guys can, can take a look at that if you miss part of it. So let me um, clean this slate and kind of summarize what you guys will expect to see in this first modular quiz. You guys really need to know about the scientific method. And the parts of the scientific method, that is the observation, the um, hypothesis, the theory, the experiment, and, maybe, and prediction. So, so the component of the scientific methods are important. If I give you a statement, can you identify what part of the scientific method that pertains to. Like if I tell you energy can either be created or can or destroyed, it's only converted from one form to the other. That's actually a, a natural law. That's a result from the, the scientific method. If I say that, okay, um, I think if you mix these two chemicals that we will have the cure for COVID, then that could be a uh, hypothesis because it's trying to explain something that, that you have. So, so know the components of the scientific method. Chapter two really is the heart of this particular um, modular quiz because in that chapter, you guys should know about scientific and exponential notation. Should be able to take any number small or large and converted over to scientific notation. You should know the rules of round significant figures. And rounding off. Okay, you should know the rules of significant figures in math operation. Okay, um, you should know uh, the metric system. You should know how to um, read, and this is part of the lab as well, uh, read measurements. And when you do measurements, you need to know the difference between accuracy and precision. 
you need to especially know how to use the, the um, techniques of dimensional analysis. And what a conversion factor happens to be, also known as unit factor or translator, if, if you've read my notes, basically translates one set of units to another. Okay, so, so that's important and you need to know how to apply it. You should know about density and specific gravity. Uh, temperature conversions. If I say, okay, what is the boiling point of water at um, for Kelvin? You guys should be able to say it's, oh, it's 100 degrees Celsius, but if you wanna convert Celsius to Kelvin, you gotta add 273 to that, so it's 373. Okay, so uh, you should be able to convert from Celsius to Kelvin and even Fahrenheit. The way you go from Fahrenheit to Kelvin is you have to go through Celsius. You got to be able to do that. Okay, so that's a majority of chapter two. In chapter three, uh, basically it has to do with matter. And you need to know the difference between phase change and uh, classification. And we did an example of that. You need to know whether something is a physical change or chemical change. You need to know the difference between a chemical property and a physical property. Physical property is something that you can describe uh, chemical property, physical property, something you can describe like the, the texture, the phase, the uh, color. Um, chemical property has to do with its reactivity. Oh, you put it in air, it reacts with air. It's chemistry, basically. Uh, you need to know about the heating cooling curve. And the calculations that are involved in that. And you need to know a little bit about nutrition and the caloric value. 